Hello folks, hope you are safe and doing well during this unprecedented times. Today we have Runsi for our today's session. He's an accomplished software engineer with strong SDLC experience working at SonicWall. And he's also a great community contributor. He's leading GDG Cloud chapter, AWS user group and senior chapter in Bangalore. So let's not keep you awaited and start today's event. Over to you, Runsi. All right, yeah, thank you so much, Karthik. So let me start by uh, starting with the presentation. So is it coming out okay? Yes, your screen is visible. All right, thank you so much. All right, so let's get started. Uh, thank you so much for having me, uh, myself, Francie, and today uh, I'm going to be talking about cloud certifications in general and how we can actually do the solutioning around the multi-hybrid cloud architecture. So there are like two sections to this. So uh, this is sort of like my promise for the next 45 minutes to uh, 60 minutes of whatever time permits that we have. And I'm going to be starting off or kickstarting it with a cloud certifications overview uh, for how you can actually get started and sort of like the myths busted, right? Because there's been like a lot of uh, negativity or negative connotations around the myths around cloud certification. So gonna be touching about those two uh, with uh, starting off and then sort of like the tips and tricks that you can actually use to ace the certifications, right? These are some of my personal uh, tips that I found to be useful uh, while taking the certifications and winding it off with the certification sections by around following the prominent influencers and the resources that you can actually use in your certification journey. And then the second phase of this presentation is going to be like about the solutioning about the new normal, so to speak, right? And that is the multi hybrid cloud architecture. And if time permits, we're gonna be winding it up with some uh, question and answers at the end, right? So before we begin, it's sort of like a short uh, summary about uh, bragging myself or so, so to speak, I'm <laughs> just kidding, right? So I've been uh, a principal software engineer right now at uh, Sonic Wall, been in the industry for quite some time. Uh, and my primary sort of like experience is in the security networking and system side and uh, been involved with the cloud that is private and public uh, since like 2007 time frame. I've got a couple of uh, certifications and uh, that's primarily the reason why I'm presenting it over here and also have a patent in cloud security and distributed data storage, right? Uh, primarily in a firm believer of multi-cloud and a huge fan of serverless and containers and especially the uh, cloud native uh, ecosystem. Apart from a professional thing, I also, as Karthik mentioned, lead the AWS, GDG, and the cloud native communities, all based in Bangalore, and speak at regular conferences. And I've also won uh, multiple uh, hackathons, especially in cloud and security. Uh, so without further ado, let's just get started. And before, I want to set the pace for this session by this great quote from Stephen Hawking, and that is, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge, right? And this is so true in case of this current topic that we're discussing, that is the certifications, right? And this aura of knowledge that a person might have by just getting a certificate, right? Because certifications is sort of like as a firm uh, believer of it is sort of like a validation of your knowledge, right? But people kind of like trick the certifications and get that tag by getting that brain dump or sort of like mugging up. So it is sort of like you are tested for the knowledge, but not necessarily that you may not have the knowledge. And this is the sort of like the myth that I want to break around right, with certifications. So setting that tune, let's just dive deep into the certifications that are offered from the Google Cloud. So this is sort of like the, uh, the path that a GCP aspiring certificate taker would have to take. So you start off with the foundation levels. And if you want to go for the GCP, you either start with the associate or if you want to go for the collaboration sort of a thing, you look at the G Suite sort of like offering. And then you progress further up with the PCA or the professional cloud architect. Now, once you are at the PCA level, it is up to you whether what you want to specialize in. 
right, whether you want to go into the data engineering side or do you want to go into the system side with respect to networking or security or sort of like the, the admin with respect to the sysops or the devops all by using the professional cloud devops engineer and then there's also the a sort of like an invite only new certifications that's been offered from gcp whether that is the hybrid cloud fill this is not like an open examination and you have to be invited for and this is sort of like the the hybrid program that's been introduced with respect to anthos the offering from google so which we will also be touching up later in the second phase of it right so this is with respect to the gcp and uh, now let's just talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room that is the leader in terms of the cloud computing space and that is aws right and if you can see it all starts with the practitioner exam so this is akin to the associate cloud engineer so you have the ccp certification and then the aws sort of like broadly divides into the next step as the architect operations or the developer and depending on which you start with the associate level for each of these so you have an associate level for solutions architect or the sysops admin or the developer and then you either go into the advanced level for the architect by taking the professional examination or the devops professional which is sort of like a culmination of sysops and the developer right and of course then comes the speciality uh, sort of like examinations whether you want a deep dive into security networking uh, data analytics databases or the alexa sort of like the, uh, the voice assistant from uh, amazon right so those are sort of like the speciality examinations and the map is not that different if you look at the azure that is the third main provider right it all starts with the ac900 that is the fundamental cloud examinations that you have today and again, this is sort of like a recommended path. You could definitely jump the hoops and then go anywhere, right? So you start with AC900 and depending on whether you want to be like an administrator or an architect or you want to specialize in security, right? So these are the various other parts that you actually use or whether you want to go for a design by taking the DP200 or the DP201 examinations. So these are all the various stuffs that you can take. And then again, you can see the similarity with respect to the Azure DevOps engineer which is sort of like a combination of whether you want to be a developer or like on the sysop side. And it's sort of like a, a merging of both of these, right? Now, the next, so this is sort of like a very overwhelming slide. You can see the multiple logos with respect to it, but I want to quickly touch upon the other providers or the other knowledge in terms of certifications that you can actually take in achieving this. So the, uh, the top left, you can see the ones from the Linux Foundation that has been supported by the CNCF or the Cloud Native Cloud Foundations. The two most top recognized certificates in terms of Kubernetes, that is the CKA and the CKAD. There are also offerings from other uh, Nuance cloud providers like Alibaba and VMware has got this full stack, Oracle certifications or the OCI infrastructure, right? And digital oceans and Docker and all the other things, right? And along with this, if you are looking for validating your knowledge, the Linux, the knowledge of Linux is also of primary importance. And you can get that by having the RHCSA or the RHCP or the RSCE examination from Red Hat. And if you are looking for like sort of like an InfoSec professional, the CCSK has got a multiple examinations and there are CISSP certifications and all the other things, right? And you could go for the security plus certifications from Comptia. And uh, the, if you are looking from the DevOps side, along with the Kubernetes, you could also go for the Docker certified associate examinations. So these are the various other third party providers and the other fourth, fifth and sixth place cloud computing IAS providers who are also offering certifications in this range, right? So this is definitely a very endless realm that we are actually talking about. So you could, you know, once you have uh, the path that is in clear, you can also go target to be the next cloud ninja if this is sort of a thing that you can actually be. And you could, uh, if sort of like a teaching is your uh, passion that you have, you could even take it as a professional level by using the, uh, or by becoming the authorized instructor from AWS or the Google Cloud authorized trainer or the Microsoft certified trainer, the NCT certifications. And this is definitely some good money that you can actually make in terms of training. And this is definitely a knowledge because more and more enterprises and more and more people are now migrating to the cloud 
and the knowledge of cloud is paramount in this new era that we're talking about. So training is definitely one of the other options that you can definitely try. So I'm gonna take a pause and I know many of you would be feeling like this. You would be like at the cross dots, with multiple options that I've just mentioned. And the feeling of being lost is perfectly normal. And which is why I would like to basically pick your battle wisely and then choose your path wisely, right? Because if you don't be in that mental mindset of playing Pokemon, right? You should not be having that certification mentality that I should be able to get certified across all the providers for all the certifications. Well, you could definitely try to be the 12X uh, AWS certified or the 10X GCP certified. If that is sort of like a ambition that you actually have, and if there is like a real use case for you personally or for in the organizations, but just don't do certifications just like playing Pokemon, right? It is fine that you don't have to have all the certifications from all the cloud providers. So just come with that mentality and uh, just don't play Pokemon. So now I wanna shift gears a little bit and just look at the uh, the multiple myths that we have. And you can see that these uh, myths are based on the unicorn thing because unicorn is definitely a myth, but uh, it's also the favored animal among the tech startups and all the tech world in general, right? And the popular myth that we have is getting that shiny new certificate would land me an interview at my dream company. Well, I'm sorry to break it to you, but this is actually a myth that has to get busted, right? Because that certificate might end up with an interview call, right? But not a job. And this is a popular myth because you might be struggling and must have struggled with or getting that certificate. But during the interview process, unless and until you have the valid hands-on knowledge, it is definitely possible that you might get blacklisted for interviewing from that company for the next six months to two years for some of the companies, right? So tread this path very carefully, and this is definitely a myth. So you may not end up with a dream job, right? Another popular myth, right? Having certifications will give me an added edge over your peers. Well, this could actually be true because you can have a certifications in your profile if you are already working and having your skills validated could actually be a good sort of like a recognition within your company and also among your peers because you are having that knowledge that are being certified, right? And this would be an added uh, increment, uh, give you like an added increment in terms of your appraisal cycle or companies that have certified professionals would give them benefit in terms of getting the partner network or having these many people certified will give them an added advantage in terms of the negotiating with the cloud providers. So this is not actually a myth, this is actually a true fact, right? And the another myth is my interview will be like a cakewalk with my certifications as a badge of honor, right? Well, um, like this is definitely a big myth because if you are certified, you can definitely expect your interview to be a little tougher as compared to the other ones, right? Because you have this proven knowledge that I am this person who has this validated knowledge and it will all the make uh, more meaningful for the interviewer to test you more about this certifications, right? So this is definitely a false impression that uh, has uh, the people going around, right? Now, the last bit is, as a student, the shiny new certifications will help me leapfrog the rest of the class in terms of knowledge and placements. Well, this is honestly a myth. And as a student, I have to tell you to please stop doing certifications, right? Students, I'm not sure why people are doing professional level certifications as a student. That just definitely beats the purpose, right? As a student, you should be focusing on your computer science fundamentals software engineering principles, system design concepts, and stop worrying about certifications and cloud things in general. Well, it is good to chase the shiny new thing, but you should chase it with a purpose, right? And if you are a student, what is the guarantee that one year down the line or one and a half year down the line, 
after your placements, right? Is it true that you are going to be working on this certified technology for the rest? Stop. So this has to honestly stop and the students should basically focus on other things to enhance their knowledge, right? So this is definitely something that is. Now, the other common trend is in terms of like the, the screaming and the shouting that you actually hear in terms around the certified professions, right? And these are some of the comments that I have personally come across or uh, some of the things that I've seen in social media against this whole negativity around certifications, right? And one of the popular thing is like, yeah, I know more than you any given day. You certified, yeah, it is fine, but I know in terms of knowledge. But you could be right, but I'm not denying it. But getting certified helps me validate it. And I'm not saying that I know everything A to Z, but I also know a little bit, maybe less than you, right? So the other popular shouting, right? You're wasting your money and time. Just keep learning, but why bother about certifications? Well, it's my choice, right? If you are a professional who is doing a certification, who's invested the money and time in doing the certifications, it's my personal choice. Nobody has forced me to do it. It's just my uh, way of doing or validating my knowledge. Employers care about knowledge. Do we get perks from being certified? Well, for this, I can honestly say yes for GCP. Because if you pass an examination in terms of GCP, there are these cool swags and goodies that you actually get. And if you pass an examination from AWS, you get like a flat 50% off for your next examination. And that is definitely a good one, right? So this is definitely true. And the other one is there are some people who take certifications like Pokemon, right? Yeah, this is actually a sad fact. And as I mentioned earlier, don't be that Pokemon, right? If you have to do a certifications, do it if there is a purpose behind it. Or it is fine that you want to take all the certifications, but check yourself that if there is a purpose behind in doing that certifications. And do you really get anything with the tag? Well, probably not immediately, but hey, I did some 10 certifications from multiple cloud providers, right? Because I felt validated and I felt there's a need. And look, I'm doing this session right now, right? I would not have got invited for doing the sessions if I was not cloud certified. Yeah, so you really gain something probably in a longer term, but not immediately, right? So that is definitely there. Can I just pass by attending video lectures? <laughs> well, I don't know, this is sort of like a very uh, funny question that I hear personally. And why should you do a certifications if you feel that you do not have the need to do it and you have to do the certifications by attending video lectures? Video lectures should be some sort of like a supplement to your additional knowledge and not just build the knowledge like how you uh, students learn Baiju's or other things, right? You learn certifications from video to enhance your knowledge or to supplement your existing knowledge. So uh, I, I don't have really an answer for this, right? What dump do you recommend? I don't know. I don't recommend any dump, right? I get certifications by probably uh, reading the documentations and then attending some of the uh, video sessions that are there or some of the courses that are available online by following influencers. And that is precisely the thing that I want to enhance and want to touch upon in this session. And I want to be like the jack of all trade or the jack of all sorts. Right? This is another popular thing that I hear shouting about people. Right. So this is similar to that Pokemon thing. And this definitely has to stop. Right. So with that, I want to bring up this lyrics that all of you can relate to this famous song from uh, Hotly California. Right? And it just says that we are all prisoners here of our own device. And it, this is really true in terms of our certifications, right? Because we all became prisoners in doing the certifications by our own means. And nobody has forced us or nobody tricked into doing this, right? It was our choice and it was our conscious thing that made us do this thing. And if our own plan has made us put us where we are. So this is definitely true when you're actually pursuing a certifications and just leave aside all the negativity that you might hear if you're pursuing like a certifications. And if you have the will and if you have the courage to actually pursue something and if you feel that there is a need, just do it by all other means. 
right and but actually let's take a step back and then see how it actually ended up like this and this is sort of like my personal analysis because the cloud providers have set an absolutely low bar as the candidate entry criteria you can be just 18 plus years as an individual to actually do a professional level or any advanced certifications that is some sort of like a really low bar for most of the certifications i'm saying most there are some who actually require a valid certifications path but this is the for the majority and sort of like a greed because it's actually a great source imagine the tons of money that AWS, GCP, and Azure is actually making from just the certification strife. It is a huge source of revenue. And this that's the reason why there is a huge push for doing a certifications generally, and not just for like a purpose behind it, right? And there is like no fixed path in doing it, but only a recommendations, and you could definitely jump. So if you want to do like a GCP or an AWS certifications, you don't have to start with the ACE or the CCP certifications. You should direct, you can directly possible to do like a specialty or a professional. And that is a flow that exists in the system and people are smart and people exploit it, right? And the hands-on knowledge is actually not tested except for few certifications like from CK or, or CKAD where it is actually a hands-on thing. Rest of it, a majority of multiple choice or multiple select. And as a student who is actually in the group of just passing examinations, it's very easy because it's being tested just for the knowledge, but not for the hands-on practical examinations. And that's precisely the reasons why some of the colleges, I find it personally shocking that they have cloud certifications as their semester targets. And this is definitely the trend in the wrong direction, right? And this has to definitely stop. And the other thing that I've recently encountered is the certifications that are being conducted in mass and the certifications training that is just given for free by some of the major thought providers. Maybe they want to gain market share or maybe they want to gain mind share. I don't know. But this is another thing that is just happening all of day. So there is this craze that is there. And part of the system is to be blamed for the negativity around certifications. But again, I want to sum it up by saying that if you are interested in doing a certifications and you feel that there is a valid justification and your thought process in doing it, please do it by all means. Just shut out the noise and then focus on the actual uh, path of doing it, right? So. Before we begin, so this is sort of like the, the quote that I want to give, and that is knowledge is having the right answer, right? You could pass certifications by just the knowledge, right? You know what it is. You could mug up all the dumps or the things and then just have the right answer. But intelligence is the one that separates in asking the right question. So this is definitely something that I want you to take it away because this will definitely go a long way in setting the tone for your certifications journey, right? And how do you build that intelligence? So these are the some of the trips. Read the right amount of documentations. And I've given the link for the providers for the three main and for Kubernetes, right? This will definitely set the pace in doing it. Another thing is the AWS FAQ. And this is something that is missing for GCP and Azure. So you could actually Google for a particular services FQ. Say if you want to read about Redshift in AWS, right? Just Google for Redshift FAQ and the FAQ page will open up, which will give you like an end-to-end validation for your particular service, right? So this is a great source of knowledge. And another one is for the CKA and CKA examinations. And for the examination also you shouldn't be building up yaml files for each of the exercises learn to do it in the imperative manner and i cannot stress this enough most of you would have found that the top uh, one of the top five results for anything that you actually search for Linux or cloud or networking or whatever, right? 
would be one of the links from DigitalOcean on how to get things done, right? They have a great resource in terms of documentations. And I've spoke to one of the developers from DigitalOcean, and one of their primary focus is on building, it, and it actually shows. So these documentations are a great way in helping you prepare for your cloud certifications journey. So just dive deep, and there are multiple aspects that are there. And the ACG discussion forms. Now, even if you don't have like a cloud guru uh, subscription, I encourage you to basically go there, register yourself, and you could pass any questions around the ACG things, right? And this will definitely help a long way in basically uh, setting up the path, right? So this is definitely a good way of doing things. So, um, so these are some of the, uh, the tips and tricks that you can actually use in uh, doing the certifications. And one of the main trick that I want to give is don't waste your money in buying certifications and technology books, right? Because the certifications books are sort of like an outdated thing that you should definitely know by. And these books definitely don't last the whole uh, things of the things. And uh, this would definitely go a long way in basically thinking. So this is something that you should definitely not be doing. And the other one, instead, you can actually use is uh, rely on a PDF and the online copy of either to download or renders me, right? So you could definitely check for the ones from uh, Kindle, or you could go for the Kindle Unlimited subscription, or for the iBook subscription, which is there. And you could definitely go for that. And the another thing is for if you're relying on video lectures, you should rely on uh, seeing the video at 1.75x to 2x speed for the concepts that you already know. And you can feel free to skip. You are not getting anything by getting that 100% completion for a video lecture. So this is definitely another trick that I definitely want to suggest for. And the other common mistake that people actually do is purchasing the same set of courses from multiple vendors. And this is definitely a thing that you should definitely uh, stop doing it because if you're preparing for a cloud architect examination, buying the same course from Udemy or Cloud Guru or Plural Site or Coursera or uh, Linux Academy, the delta is actually very small and there isn't much significant value additions from attending multiple courses. So this should definitely not be engaged. Don't waste your money in that. And the other one is just don't be overconfident just because you've passed a practice test. Because this is definitely not the right way. And the practice test tends to be like a very easy thing of passing the examination. So you don't have to be doing this. And if you go into an examination just because you based and practice, chances are that you would actually fail in the examinations because practice test gives you that conference of, hey, this thing is something very simple and I can now purchase examination. So this is a bait into purchasing that examination. So, but uh, the actual examinations tend to be a little more harder than the practice tests, right? So with that, I want to dive deep into the uh, specific trainings that have been offered or some of the contents that have come across in terms of GCP. And the number one thing that I want to search is for the official exam guide for GCP. So if you're purchasing, uh, if you're preparing for any GCP examinations, just search for the exam guide to help you prepare and set the tone for the rest of your uh, study stuff in terms of that. And Quick Labs, right? Uh, I highly recommend everyone to follow Quick Labs on Twitter because they have promotions. Uh, run end to end throughout the year, which will give you free credits. And also some of the time they open a quest during some of the days, especially like on a Friday or a Saturday. And you could dive deep into some of the quests that are available. There are also a lot number of free quests that are available on Quick Labs if you actually sign up for it. And uh, don't try to purchase anything because it's pretty expensive. One credit is equivalent to actually $1, but you wouldn't have to worry about it. And the chapters like GDG Cloud Ahmedabad would be conducting uh, study uh, jams across where it is possible that you might get some promo codes as well, because Google conducts these uh, study jams throughout the year. So uh, feel free to get in touch with the local chapters as needed, right? And 
my other official recommendations is coursera which is sort of like the number one recommendations because this is the official course that is there for uh, google cloud and i recommend to use coursera for any gcp specific things and the other one for advanced or professional levels for especially with terms of data engineering or uh, networking and security are the courses that i found to be from uh, a, a cloud guru and linux academy for the gcp so definitely check that out because the contents that are being released there are obviously much more newer as compared to the other ones especially for like the devops engineer and all the other things right and with these i want to give like a two personal recommendations of the youtube channels which are actually free so these have a great set of content that is there which is updated weekly and the other one is the learn gcp with mahesh uh, so he is sort of like a person who's based in bangalore he keeps uploading the solutioning videos and the other general tips and tricks on acing your uh, gcp examination the other one is the awesome gcp channel from Satish Vijay, who is a GDE, and uh, he also keeps uh, scenario-based videos around uh, the GCP solution, right? So these are the GCP-specific training courses. With that, I want to move into the AWS, and I cannot stress this enough. The AWS course is definitely the recommended one would be the A Cloud Guru. They have detailed uh, deep dive course sessions for all the 12 to uh, 13 certifications uh, courses that they have and this is definitely my number one recommendations and also encourage you to sign up for a very generous free tier from aws that is for one year where you should be able to play around for most of these scenarios and questions that you might come across and uh, most of the services would be free and if it's not like a free thing you would be specifically one that you are going outside the free tier so uh, i recommend everyone if you do not have like a aws account to sign up and get that 365 days of freedom right and the other one is the aws documentation because it's pretty extensive i found the aws documentations to be much more extensive than uh, gcp and maybe even azure and they keep a good job of uh, making sure that the services are pretty much up to date and the faqs that i've mentioned earlier is a great recommendation before sitting uh, for the examination, right? Uh, the other one is the AWS well-architected framework to search for this and it will help you get a grip on the various definitions and the technologies that you can actually use for the examinations and uh, learning AWS in general and not just for the examinations, right? And if you have taken an exam earlier, make sure you use this perk or benefit that you actually get. And if you pass an examination, you get a free practice exam benefit and a practice exam voucher that you can very well make use of for the examination. So you can use that voucher to reading and then just get anything for your next set of practices, right? And the other one is sort of like a YouTube channel from Manoj Fernando. He is a AWS organizer based out of Colombo in Sri Lanka. And uh, he's got some uh, 5,500 subscribers and he keeps uploading uh, the AWS uh, in-depth videos, one video every week. So this is definitely a very good channel that you should definitely be following in terms of AWS cloud computing channel on YouTube, right? So with that, I wanna set the pace for the Kubernetes specific training resources that are there. And the popular and the most economical ones are the ones that you already know probably. This guy is pretty famous. His name is Mumshad Munambet from codecloud.com. And you can find detailed in-depth videos for CK and CKD. And one thing that you actually get the benefit if you purchase this course is you get access to uh, Katakoda service, which you can definitely use for uh, playing around for one hour. And if you do not have a big budget money to spend on GKE or an AKS cluster or an EKS cluster, I highly recommend to download Minikube, which will help you set up like a local system on your things to try out these hands of examinations uh, for uh, setting up your uh, Kubernetes cluster, right? And the other one, since it is like a hands-on, you have to leave and breathe YAML syntax. And this is sort of like a de facto language for Kubernetes, right? There is no other way for it. This is the number one thing that you should definitely learn for mastering Kubernetes and not just for the examinations, right? 
and you have to be familiar with vi and vim i don't want to get into that battle of vim versus emacs but the environment that is being provided for the ck or the ckd examination has just vi or vim and you have to play around with this right and one other course recommendations that i have if you are completely starting off with kubernetes from beginning is this free course from cncf that is available on edx.org it's the link that is given down and you could definitely play around and start uh, getting a feel of the kubernetes uh, from scratch right and uh, the other one is a great GitHub repository that I've personally come across uh, on uh, for the CKD practice examinations. And it is highly recommended to solve all of these questions in this before you sit for the CKD. I was not able to find anything similar for CK, but CKD, this is definitely one thing that I personally have attempted before my CKD examination, right? And the other one is the Kata Coda. Probably uh, many people would be familiar with this. Uh, you could sign up for it and get this environment going for one hour to play around for the multiple labs that are there, right? And the last but not the least, is sort of like uh, recommendations from the Kubernetes official workspace that are there. I highly recommend you to join the Slack workspace at kubernetes.slack.com and join these channels for CK exam prep and CKD exam preparations. There are like a ton of resources that are there and people are generally helpful and responsive for all of your questions. So with that, I cannot stress this enough, right? Yes, you are doing a multiple choice or a multi, uh, multi select examinations, but it's all about practice. And uh, the one thing that I would recommend is Wislabs. So Wislabs is highly recommended for any real world scenario examinations, whether it be in terms of GCP or AWS or databases or any of the other things and any web technologies as well. They have exhaustive practice tests or mock examinations as they call it, which would give you like a very good feel and check your exam preparations, right? And you could even, if it's like a hands-on examination, like a CK or a CKAD, I highly recommend this GitHub repository, which you can definitely use for your practice environment, right? So this is definitely a good boost to your setup if you do not have like a mini cube or a Kata Kora environment. And uh, the other one is the official study guide or resources that are available from uh, MindHub. I personally found it to be a little expensive because other, other cheap alternatives that are available in terms of Udemy and Labs and all the uh, A-Cloud Guru and all the other things. But if you feel like doing for the official recommendations, you can definitely check out MindHub because it's the official strategy guide. And last but not the least, Linux Academy, right? It is definitely good in terms of cloud in general and all of the other deep dive specifics for Linux and Azure and all the GCP and all the other things, right? Do check out their extensive courses and I highly recommend to go for a subscription. If you have the money, uh, they also have like, I think a 14 day free trial or something. And this is definitely a good place to do all your uh, practice tests and all the other things, right? So they have some few practice tests as well along with the courses, right? So. Uh, I want to take a pause here because it looks like Elon Musk has just tweeted. <laughs> no, sorry, just kidding. Right? But what I want to point out is my slides are basically up on my Twitter handle. And uh, I know there's like a ton of resources that I've covered in uh, the previous slides. And it would be unfair for all of you to basically keep taking notes. So I've made all of these slides open. It is available on my slide share link. And I've tweeted the link uh, at my uh, Twitter handle, at Transume. So feel free to check it out and uh, download, and then um, all the very best for your uh, certifications journey. So with that, I am going to be diving into my second phase of this presentation, and that is the, uh, the multi-hybrid cloud and how you can actually solution for the new norm, right? And this is some sort of like a trend that I've seen personally emerging in the last uh, two, two and a half years. And uh, this is actually a good trend that should definitely be practiced and encouraged, right? So what exactly is that? And before I dive deep right, about the multi-hybrid cloud, I just want to set the tone for uh, cloud in general, right? Because many people seem to get confused 
on these various terminologies and techniques that are emerging every day, so to speak, in the cloud computing. Yes, cloud computing is a very evolving thing, but my suggestion is don't approach cloud as a new cloud, right? Understand the computer science fundamentals that are actually there. And this would definitely help you go a long way because end of the day, majority of the workloads are based on either the x86 or the x64 architecture that is running on a Linux backbone, right? Yes, I am not, there are also the AMD and the Windows and everything, but most of it is either an x86 or an x64 architecture running on Linux, right? So understand this and approach cloud in that manner. Think of cloud as sort of like a physical entity that is like a set of servers that are behind an API endpoint. What you actually call cloud that is AWS GCP, they are not cloud, but services that are being defined by a public API. And I know some of you might find these definitions like a very basic ones, but I am setting the pace for this whole confusing jargons that are just arising every week, right? And uh, feel free to actually uh, skip uh, hearing this, uh, but just setting the pace, right? And think of the cloud as fundamental blocks of compute, storage, memory, and networking. This is the computer fundamentals of computing. And understanding these four concepts will definitely go a long way. Yes, there is security, there is access controls, and there are all the other things with respect to searching and all the other things. But these are layers on top of the fundamental hardware models that are being defined by compute, storage, memory, and networking. And the other things are built on top of these, right? And you can see that there are multiple names. See, you could see like a whole set of jargons that are there for multiple things, right? You could call it as an EC2 or a GCP computer, an Azure VM, but that's a compute, right? There are the NoSQL jargons for Firestore and DynamoDB and Cosmos. Just don't get confused, right? I mean, one thing that I can uh, personally relate to is when I started learning computers like long time back uh, in my college days, there's this search engine was a new term, right? And we were just wondering, what is this engine that is just behind this web? And then Google was just starting off at that point of time, right? But do we get flustered by this term search engine now? No, right? So don't be flustered by these new terms that are arising out of cloud jargons that are uh, every day right now. These are ultimately some sort of like compute storage memory and network. Think of it that way. And I want all of you to think with these two memes that are there, right? There is just no cloud. It's just someone else's computer, right? It's as simple as that. You are just borrowing it. And what are clouds? It's just Linux servers. So with that, I want to set the pace for multi-cloud. And what exactly is a multi-cloud? So it's a strategy that you actually use for multiple cloud provider providers, whether it be like SaaS, PaaS, CAS, DAS, whatever as, right? It's sort of like a single heterogeneous architecture. And there are multiple offerings. All of them come together in some sort of like a poetry, so to speak, to define this multi-cloud architecture, right? So these are the various, uh, this is an enterprise, and these are the various sort of like the uh, departments that you will typically find within a company. There are the influencers or the decision makers, the developers, the IT ops people, and the infosec person, right? And all of them have a different set of requirements. The influencers would say that I want to manage cost, but also use that for negotiating the contracts, right? We also have the developers who want to invest the time for innovation and agility, and not just for spending time in sticking the stuff together with the platform right? There are these IT ops people who want like a consistent and reliable model or single pane of class view to actually manage everything irrespective of whether it's space operated or. And there are these infosec people who would say that I want to be like an enabler, so to speak, and there should be like a consistency in managing these policies, right? So these are the various conversations that you actually find within an organization. And let's see if that poetry of multi-cloud comes into the picture, right? So you have on the left side, the on-premise data center, and on the right side, this multi-cloud, the private public hybrid cloud paradigm. And this person is sort of like 
going for this bridge of promise to build it all together across this across this uh, this analogy of smooth runway, right? And this is the expectations that you would definitely have, right? So this benefits that's being provided by the multi-cloud are in terms of redundancy, right? You could have like across the data across, you could bring up your load across the geography, even if there are no data centers by the cloud providers that you primarily have, right? If you choose GCP, which may not have regions across the world, but if you choose GCP along with AWS or Azure, which may not, may have a data center there, you are essentially solving for latency. So this is definitely a good advantage with multi-cloud, right? And you are leveraging the unique cloud-specific services we need, right? For example, uh, GCP is more of a developer cloud, but AWS is more of a DevOps cloud. So the tooling is given more importance in terms of AWS. But the services are actually good in terms of GCP for data engineering. So you can use the best of both worlds to solve your problems better if you're using a multi. And you can actually take advantage of the public cloud. If you have already invested significantly in the private cloud in your term data center, you could use your public cloud to scale out as needed for bursty workloads, right? And this is where the multi-hybrid cloud comes into the picture. So you rely on your private infrastructure, that is your data center, and then scale it out with multiple offerings. And as I said earlier, make use of the services that have short burst or spikes in the public cloud, right? So if you feel that there is this spike that is happening and you don't want to provision this huge beefy server on your private data center, which would consume a lot of ton of resources in terms of power management and other aspects, right? Move of them into the public cloud. And that is where the true advantage comes into the picture. And you can have the various levels of security concerns that you could actually manage effectively by using this multi-hybrid cloud model, right? So with that benefit, this is how the reality looks like, right? You, you may not have like a smooth runway to connect between the, the private and the public. It could actually be like a bamboo stick that, and you could find yourself balancing between life and death, right? And that's like a sad reality. And why is that? Because there is like a lot of pain point and I don't want that cloud to end up with this mushroom cloud that you get up by bursting an atom bomb, right? So this pain point should definitely be solved because let's trust it. These are built by different companies and they have a different set of APIs and the encodings and the formats would differ. We might end up with a JSON format, an XML format, or a proto buff that is being juggled with an R a gRPC interface, right? So there are these problems with respect to encodings and versionings and all the other things that you definitely find if you do a multi-cloud thing. The abstractions change. Yes, this is definitely true in terms of the network and the storage layer, especially because you would have to deal with it differently. And primarily that is because there is a huge difference in the underlying hypervisor. Not everyone would use the same hypervisor for this thing, right? People would have defined or designed GCP differently from the people who would have defined or uh, designed AWS because the, it would have a different set of objectives in mind by defining this. And this would definitely come into the picture when you have like a dedicated server or when there are like issues that you're solving in terms of the kernel level. So this would definitely be a huge thing. And then Obviously, there is this variations with cost models and billings and reporting and alerts and notifications and all the other things, right, that are definitely there. So this is definitely something that is there. And you have to approach it as truly different applications with a different set of semantics. And having this mindset of thought process would definitely help you a long way in architecting the solutions for the multi-cloud or a multi-hybrid cloud the need, as the need permits, right? So how do you think it, right? I know there are like solutions that are polyglot or built with multiple programming languages. So now think of solutions that are multi-cloud or polycloud as sort of like speed. So if you think of solutions built similar to build with similar uh, multiple programming languages. So you deploy using the cloud specific. So don't just rely on uh, something that is very native to a cloud provider, but a cloud native way of doing things. Don't use like a cloud formation in AWS or like a deployment manager in GCP or whatever, right? Use Terraform. 
So that would help you basically get it in an abstracted manner for doing things, right? Have tools that translate your concepts to cloud specific ones, right? So don't just rely on the API calls, but look at your end objective in doing things. And this would definitely go a long way because you have a primary objectives in consuming this. And you basically design for geographic dispersity. So as I said earlier, plan for actions that are actually there across. And uh, if you are actually planning for a geographic dispersity where the data center is not present, so you could actually think of that, right? And think of how you can actually share the data across, right? Now, if this is paramount in terms of like a EU region or a Europe region or an EMEA region where the data security and privacy is very they cannot leave that particular boundary right so if you want to build for something which is specific to an EMEA region so you have to have that sort of like a data centricity around EMEA and it cannot reside on your private or multi-cloud region right so it should be that is where your investment comes in building up your own data center so to speak and this is another thing of a multi-hybrid cloud and uh, the other solutions that or other objectives that you should keep in mind is whether you should be designing for high availability, right? Now, if you're deploying like an on-prem solution, high availability is a given. You wouldn't think about much of a high availability if it's like a cloud because yes, there is a fault tolerance that is there uh, to some extent, but that doesn't mean that your applications in the cloud are automatically fault tolerant. You have to design for it. But if you have like a containerized or a microservice way of doing things, it is fault tolerant to something. But if it is like a traditional monolith applications that you have built on the cloud, you have to design for uh, high availability. And this is where sort of like the differentiation that comes to the picture in terms of multi cloud, right? So these are the particular use cases where you would need like a multi hybrid cloud where you want some sort of like an edge processing or analytics to take place at the on premise before moving the data into the cloud, where you want some sort of like an application model uh, to be run. So this is where if you have like a data bench uh, or a workbench that you want to bring around for your data analyst on your cloud, on your data, uh, data center so that they can start building the models here before moving it into the cloud, right? And same application, so this is more like for a DevOps person where it's very easy to have like a pane of glass view, a single pane of glass view to deploy your applications across any location. So this is definitely helpful in that manner as well, right? And what are the applications that need to remain on premises, right? So there are two broad categories that are applications that are sensitive to latency. So you cannot have like an applications in the cloud if you do not have like a data center region in the cloud, which is close to where you operate from. So for that, you would need to invest in applications that are definitely there, right? And applications that need to process the data locally. Say, uh, you does it make sense to move uh, petabytes of data or to the cloud of unprocessed data? So it makes sense to have some sort of like a processing or a data sifting at the local level before the process data is moved into the cloud because uh, trust uh, in saying that the ingress to the cloud is definitely a huge cost factor and the data movement is definitely going to take some time uh, is going to eat up in a cloud budget and so these are the two broad scenarios where you would need an on-premise systems right and that is the reason why the IT is basically forced into this decision whether I should design for security versus the agility the other thing is, should I worry about reliability or should I worry about cost? So these are the constant decisions that are definitely happening in enterprises across. And should I worry about portability or lock-in, right? And if you have designed your applications, like a classic example, like for AWS DynamoDB, which is sort of like uh, number one in terms of the NoSQL database, right? You would have already locked in for that particular data model. But now if you want to, port it out into something. So this is sort of like a classic uh, dilemma that you might have. Uh, so these are the various things that you should definitely consider when designing for the future expansion in terms of it. And this is how Google approaches it. Now, I don't want to read this out fully and look at the highlighted pieces that the applications could be containerized as microservices, right? It could be a microservice model. Uh, and microservices not just necessarily mean containers, it could be the fast model of doing things also. 
and you could have like a declarative system with a single control experience that is defined with a service mesh and which spans across the application locations. So these are the highlighted components for a multi-hybrid cloud solution or a hybrid solution from a Google's perspective, right? And that is where the modern application development is a little different because you need to have the open software to avoid the locking. You need to have like a container or a microservice way of doing things, right? And microservices could also be like the fast model, as I just mentioned, it could be the pure serverless also. That is also a microservice. You could have like a CI, CD or a DevOps way, uh, which is uh, gone are the days where you follow like a waterfall model and then go for like a six to seven month of doing things, right? Now it's all about move fast and break things. But some of the times you may not have to move fast and break things. The old way of doing things is also pretty okay. And you could have it orchestrated across the different goals, right? So this is definitely a, uh, one of the objectives of the modern applications. And you could have it defined by the services and the API management. So this is definitely make sure that your applications as are mentioned by an endpoint. And this comes back to the few slides that I've talked earlier saying that cloud is nothing but an API service. And your modern application has to leverage that. So these are the, some of the thought processes in modern applications. And this is where the Google's Anthos comes into the picture, a sort of like a hybrid offering, because it helps you modernize your applications with a unified management philosophy, which puts the security by default. So you don't have to basically put the layer on top of it. It is just coming by it, right? <clears throat> because it uses the, uh, the K-native infrastructure that is there. And it is built for portability to avoid the lock-in because everything is like a containerized thing that is built on top of Kubernetes. So it's very much the cloud native way of doing things, which helps you provide like a consistent experience everywhere and with lowering the TCO. Right? So this is where the Anthos way of doing things comes in the picture from sort of like a solution from GCP. Now, Let's shift into the Azure way of hybrid cloud, and that is the Azure stack. Now, uh, bear in mind that the Azure stack is sort of like a, a primary uh, innovator in terms of hybrid, because this got released in 2016, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and the Anthos and the AWS offering, which I'll talk about next, sort of like is a last uh, year entry, right? And Azure based stack gives you that same set of uh, agility and innovation in the cloud computing as similar to that of an Azure, right? And this helps you make sure that the organizations can build the modern applications across the hybrid cloud environments that they operate in. And this is sort of like uh, the offerings that are being provided in terms of the Azure public and the Azure stack, which is there on on-premise. And if you look at the third uh, row that is there, you have the IAS and the PaaS offerings, which are there in Azure, but in the Azure stack, not all is basically ported out. Yes, they are still building out things and this keeps improving. And this is the same case in terms of uh, the AWS offerings as well. And it would be like a ultimate transformation of Azure into the on-premise thing. So right now we just have the service fabric and the container service that is the AKS and all the other app service and the storage and network things that are fundamental for any cloud workload. Right? So this is the AWS Azure stack of doing things. Now let's shift into the AWS and the AWS Outpost, which got announced at last reInvent, that is the 2019 reInvent, is basically extending the same AWS designed infrastructure as sort of like a fully managed and operated by the AWS board. So this helps you get a rack mountable system on your data premise by running the same set of services that are there in AWS. So you have these set of services for general availability as the first release for compute and networking and database. They have the RTS that has been ported out. You can run container workloads with the EKS. And then there's also the data processing that is there with respect to Elastic MapReduce, so sort of like a redshift equivalent uh, for the big data thing, right? So this is with respect to from the AWS tape, right? So with that, you can actually see that the trend is actually going towards a hybrid model of doing things where you would want the same convenience that was there in the cloud to be there on your on-premise as well. Because there is this huge concern about data privacy and security, and you wouldn't want your sensitive data to be in the cloud. 
and enterprises have been taking advantage and this is not something new and uh, this has been there since the saas providers it's been there with the office 365 productivity suits or the salesforce way of doing things or the work day for the hr right and the emerging trend is to use the multiple ias and saas providers cloud was never designed for a jail or a lock in thing right the whole purpose of using a cloud was to basically increase or scale up your workload in an elastic manner if i can borrow the aws way uh, aws world right so over the period of time in the last 10 12 years right the cloud basically sort of like emerged into like a jail model where you go into the cloud and then you are locked in and now it's sort of like breaking out where there is this huge emphasis on portability for your workloads and this is sort of like the organic growth that we can actually see in multi cloud and the multi hybrid cloud in general and if there is one take away that all of you should have it is definitely the saying that the multi hybrid is the new norm so with that i want to give it a wrap over here uh, and then uh, open it up for any uh, questions or comments whatever we may have so i can take up any questions if there need be Do we have any questions? Mm. Hey, Ranjit, I think uh, um, Kunjan has a one question. Can you please tell the basic or high-level difference between Google Cloud and Azure or AWS? Where should I start uh, my cloud journey? Okay, so this is definitely a very good question because. Uh, it only comes up to your decision that you want to take so uh, gcp and uh, azure has some sort of like a huge advantage in terms of picking up the industries for fmcg or retail right because aws is completely banned in entering that i mean it's not a ban but uh, since amazon operates in fmcg and retail so providers like walmart and target they are not comfortable in shifting their workloads over there so if you want to work in an industry that is primarily in retail in industry uh, fmcg or something i recommend you to take up uh, learning the gcp or uh, azure and if you want to focus on more of a devops way or a sysops way of doing things then uh, aws is definitely a good way to pick it up because aws is i mean just accept it right it's sort of like the pioneer in the cloud and knowing the aws knowledge will help you go a long way and you could actually put in all the pieces together as you build up your cloud journey so the fundamental knowledge of aws is very much recommended and you could build on the specialities on depending on your workload that you want for either azure or gcp anything else so i guess we are good right yeah uh, so i think uh, uh, there's there are no more questions uh so thank okay. you so much ramsi it was a really insightful session i think we have uh, uh, been like in the session for over an hour now uh, a lot of people who okay. are uh, in the live stream must have gained a lot of value out of it and they can obviously reach out to you personally uh, i think you are very active on twitter and other social media channels uh i would like to take a moment to thank uh, thank you like you have spent a lot of work behind preparing for this and uh, uh, it was really insightful some of the uh, topics that you have talked about uh, specifically like busting the meat 
uh, myths that are around uh, certification that was very good so thank you so much uh, for like uh, taking the session uh, we really appreciate uh, your time mm -hmm. and i would also like to thank uh, my team members karthik uh, harsh jigar who put in a lot of work to like make this happen mm -hmm. sure thank and, you so uh, much nikunj and thanks for having me okay. yeah and everyone who joined during the live stream thank you so much i hope you guys enjoyed the session uh, do share your feedback in comments or, or on a, on the meetup group and do share your ideas for the next uh, session we would love to like uh, hear uh, the topics that you want to uh, learn more and uh, organize the sessions around okay. thank you guys first uh, kartik anything else no 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 oh. uh i would like to say that there are a few questions but uh, i guess runsi has left the group more more question we can take offline so we will uh, forward this question to runsi and like uh, uh for answers and comments cool the slides are also shared in the comments so folks yeah. can check there out Cool. So I think we can end the session. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Yep. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. -bye.